Hello and welcome to the evening news for today, Friday, June 6, 2014. I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. In the headlines, Alan Gates confirms that PNC had used security forces for surveillance of political opposition. Norman McLean claims he was unaware of GDF guns being transferred to thugs. Tom Clark Carroll Suba says normalcy slowly returning to City Hall. Man charged for trying to sneak live rounds into jail. And father of three gets 16-year jail sentence for fraud. Now for the news in detail. Former Ghana Police Force Corporal Alan Gates today testified that the Working People's Alliance Party was under surveillance by the security forces at that time. Several parts of this testimony earlier today also sharply contradicted the information given to the Commission by former Major General Norman McLean yesterday. Alexis Rodney reports. One day after former Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defense Force Norman McLean appeared before the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry, claiming that he knew nothing of surveillance carried out on the political opposition in the 1980s, a former police officer today testified that a then a government had indeed facilitated surveillance activities within the Working People's Alliance. Alan Gates, who is currently serving a 48-month sentence at the Cam Street Prison for allegedly obtaining money by false pretense, said he was paid an extra $500 back in 1979 by the Ghana Police Force to work as an undercover agent in the Working People's Alliance. The first thing he asked, uh, where did you work last night? I said, well, um, Dr. Ruth Ryan was a, a guest of the police and I... Uh, he started using threats and intimidation, like he's going to charge me for treason and uh, all sort of stuff he starts saying. Then he said, um, you know what, um, you're the mommy one. Then there were three telephones on the desk, I can remember, black White Part of the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry's Terms of Reference speaks to the involvement of the security forces during the late 1979 and early 1980s in surveillance of the political opposition. Yesterday, the former chief of the military body said that he was never involved in such activities. In fact, according to him, the army was too much involved in its own affairs to be carrying out such activities. However, today, the former police officer said that he was carrying out these functions at the behest of the police force, whose head Cecil Skip Roberts was closely tied to the army chief. Gates informed the commission of his meeting up with William Gregory Smith at the Working People's Alliance Tiger Bay office. Unlike what was claimed by McLean yesterday that Smith was around that time a deserter of the defense force, Gates said that he was informed by Smith himself that he was still a serving member of the force. However, his appearance at that time assumed to him that Smith might have been playing an undercover role for the GDF as well. Help me, um, when you took him aside in a corner, doctors Rodney and Ruben Rain were upstairs. Yes, sir. You see him, you are pleasantly surprised, as you say. Yeah, you uh, well, to see him at that. Yeah, and residence. you took him to, to a side in a corner. Yes, sir. You asked him what he was doing there. What was his reply? He said he's doing some stuff. Some um, stuff. What did you understand that to me? I don't know, sir. Um, like I said, he too wasn't too comfortable with us having a long conversation here. That's why we arranged the next evening. No, but meet. this is what we call self-perception, sense perception evidence. What did you understand him to be saying to you? He's doing some stuff. Well, I imagine he was doing the same thing I was doing. That, that, that's what crossed my mind. You felt so? I felt so. Yes, because I, I didn't understand how is it that you said the purpose was to exchange some information. Um, so you thought he was on the same mission as you? Yeah, after he said he was still in the army. Like, I know you wouldn't risk his job. Yesterday, the former army chief told the commission that the military body at that time was a disciplined force, noting that its members would not be involved in surveillance activities. He, however, did not deny that the then head of state, Lyndon Phillips Samson Burnham, had it in his capacity to execute such activities through the Joint Intelligence Unit, which comprised Major General Joseph Harmon from the Guyana Defense Force and Larry Lewis from the Guyana Police Force. For the evening news, I'm Alexis Rodney. Meanwhile, Alexis Rodney joins us again to report that retired Major General Norman McLean 
yesterday claims that he was unaware that guns were given to House of Israel thugs and elements. McLean claimed that he was not suffering from Alzheimer, but half Alzheimer instead. Details in this report. Admitting yesterday that Dr. Rodney had infiltrated the Guyana Defense Force, the former chief of staff said that he was unaware that the force had ever handed over weapons to the House of Israel, a religious cult that was allegedly used by the PNC government as a tool of oppression during the late 70s and early 80s. McLean also dismissed the document showed to him by Commission's Counsel Glenn Hanneman, suggesting that the Army had indeed made a transfer of weapons to the House of Israel group. I had asked that probably we should get a fingerprint expert to identify, because this does not, by my recollection, uh, and remember, my force is dead. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long he's dead, but um, this does not appear to be a signature. And I believe that we should have somebody authenticate and say whether this is any re recollection of... But apart from that, the, yeah. the, the form itself, uh, you seem to recall that it was a, a form of the, of the Guyana Defense Force. It uh, says Guyana Defense Force, a conk form, yeah. GDF number, whatever it is. Yeah. I, I mean, as chief of staff, yeah. all these details I hardly would know yes. that this is the right form, but certainly it would appear to uh, be a on the surface form. Of I it. have no problem with that. On the surface. McLean, who was also at the helm of the Guyana National Service, pointed out that the GDF was not in the habit of transferring weapons to organizations outside the security force. Let me ask you a question. When, when if arms or ammunition are being distributed, within the army, a record is kept of that. That would be the standard procedure, that a written record is kept of the movement of arms, whether into or outside of the army. There would probably there would be a record to show any such movement. Thank you. He's telling me about some form mark of conk, I don't know. I, I've moved away from that, okay. sir. And in relation to those records, it would indicate perhaps who received them and who moved them from one place to another or to a particular person. Thank you. Several witnesses had previously testified that the House of Israel was on many occasions offered arms and ammunition by the government through the security force. One witness, Joseph Hamilton, in his testimony had indicated that the religious body was even offered training in the use of firearms from an officer, Wycliffe McAllister, of the Guyana Defense Force. McLean said that while he knew McAllister, he could not state if the officer had indeed offered such service to the House of Israel organization. For the Evening News, I'm Alexis Rodney. Tom Clark Carl Suba says that normalcy is being returned to the Georgetown City Council despite the non-cooperation tactics being employed by the mayor and his councillors. Speaking at a press conference this afternoon at the City Hall, Suba told representatives from the media that normalcy has been restored at the council and citizens will soon see the results of this. She related that despite persistent efforts of the mayor and his confederates to stymie me and hinder the progress of the council, they have persisted and is progressing well. Suba noted, too, that the road to normalcy was one which was filled with major obstacles and disturbances, but her supportive staff were determined to succeed and overcome those. I also want to thank my senior officers who have been working most assiduously given the circumstances of the council at this time and as you can see their faces you will understand how difficult their jobs have become but yet they stand firmly and with the strength of character that they can cooperate and bond with me to execute the work which they're employed to do. Thank you, officers, for being here and for being here through difficult circumstances. And yet, you survived. 
The acting town clerk disclosed that since the situation has been brought under control, works will be commencing around the city, among which will be the clearance of garbage and the issuance of certificates and permission for the erection of buildings to contractors. In addition, the city hall is slated to undergo rehabilitation, which will be undertaken by the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport. I want to also mention the Stabrook Market Wharf. That wharf is in a terrible state. And we had planned originally to deal with that wharf earlier. However, as recent as this morning, I have advised for the revised estimates to be submitted and the city engineer, Mr. Calvin Venture, advised that we go public tendering. She noted that though normalcy is prevailing at the moment, the permanency of temporary nests will be determined on Monday when the council's statutory meeting is scheduled to be held. The past five statutory meetings were cancelled, called off or hindered due to the conflicts existing between the mayor, town clerk and the public relations officer, Royston King. Reporting for the evening news, Gomuti Gangadin. The main opposition party, a partnership for national unity, has refused to pass the anti-money laundering and conquering the financing of terrorism bill unconditionally. Details in this report. Opposition leader David Granger has declined to heed the advice and appeal of President Donald Ramatar and his cabinet as far as the passage of the anti-money laundering bill is concerned. Granger told media today that while the opposition party remained committed to passing the bill soon, it could not do so unconditionally. At this 11th hour, Granger is calling for dialogue on the way forward. I met him again last Monday and I will continue to be the president because we feel this is in the national interest. But the PPP doesn't intend to budge and you pay attention to the language the president is using. He's calling on the APNU to unconditionally support the amendments which they put on the table. What sort of language is that? Is that the language of compromise? Is that the language of negotiation? Why should we unconditionally support anything? So that's where we are. We're not going to unconditionally support what the PPP puts on the table. We're going to negotiate so that both, all three sides, APNU, AFC, and the PPP, can arrive at an outcome which is satisfactory to the Guyanese people. Further, Granger contended that the opposition remains firm in its stance to deliver a compliant and transparent money laundering act to the public. Granger accused the government of being disinterested in this undertaking at the special select committee level. It is clear that the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration has no intention of expediting the, the completion of the work of the Special Select Committee and the passage of anti-money laundering legislation. Um, they speak of deadlines, deadlines come and go, but the PPP administration is sauntering along happily without any major concern um, to bring this matter to conclusion. Guyana was recently referred to the Financial Action Tax Force by the Caribbean Action Tax Force. On a global scale, financial institutions have been cautioned about the risk of doing business with Guyana by CFATF after the country was blacklisted. For the Evening News, Shania Singh. Join us after the break for more news. This is the Evening News. This is the Evening News on TVG. Welcome back. BK International is calling on the relevant authorities to play their part in rectifying the issue relating to the three kilometer of extension of roads that will give access to Georgetown. Let's find out more in this report. BK International today stated that it is 18 months behind the Tamari Road project leading into Georgetown due to utility matters regarding the Ghana Telephone and Telegraph Company. This was stated by the project coordinator of BK International, Lionel Kandasami. He stated that the company has been in constant contact with the Utilities Commission and gt and to have the situation rectified so that they can continue their work. The 
construction of a new two-lane passage to the, and from the, the airport. It's consistently delayed because of utility problems, removal of utility problems. As it is, for more than 18 months, we have been stuck where we are with the construction because of utility problems. In that, it has reached an impasse where we don't seem to be going forward in any direction. Kandasami said that jt and is not doing anything to help, but is sending them invoices for cables that they are supposedly being damaged. We have been consistently writing the employer, who is the Ministry of Works. Every Monday morning, there's a reminder letter that is sent to the coordinator, reminding, I wonder if that's the right word, but just notifying again and again and again that we are still faced with these problems. It's a weekly reminder. It's, it's now become like habitual. It was also mentioned that it is costing the company a lot more money than they budgeted for initially. The material cost has risen tremendously, as you know, over the last year. And we are going back 18 months. In addition to that, we have the human resources costs. If we were to demobilize, these are skilled people that we have in our employ. Will we be able to get them back? No. And if we do get them back, what else do we have to do to, to retain them? So we are carrying additional costs in the interest of the project. The company is therefore calling on the relevant authorities in gt and to play their part in resolving this issue so that works can continue. For the Evening News, I'm Gabriella Patram. A partnership for national unity says that it is still awaiting a draft plan that will seek to turn around Guyana's sugar industry. Let's find out more in this report. While Guy Suko is well on the way to meet his first crop target for 2014, AP and Yelena David Granger is questioning the availability of a plan to turn the sugar industry around. We want to see a holistic plan. This is what we called uh, for the National Assembly since 2012 and 2013 again and 2014. There is no plan and every year they come for billions of dollars in subvention and we were asked to see a holistic plan. I have not seen a holistic plan yet. So when we see it, we'll be able to examine it and determine whether we, we give it our support. We have, um, we have, we do know that our Shadow Minister for Agriculture, Dr. Rupert Ryan, did go up to Skelton to examine the factory operations there and did present a report to the Shadow Cabinet. But that is just one factory. And uh, our Shadow Minister for Economic Affairs, Mr. Carl Grinch, has mentioned um, other possibilities of public-private partnerships, he also mentioned the possibility of some of the lands, I think, um, being used by private cane farmers. And um, maybe those canes could be taken to state control factories, but we're looking at a mix of options. But there's no finality to these um, options as yet. But once we see the holistic plan, we'll be able to, to comment. Nonetheless, Grinch related that his party remains committed towards the development of the sugar industry which provides jobs for a significant amount of Guyana's population. We would like to see the sugar industry survive. As you know, um, we approved the subvention this year, but uh, we continue to insist that more must be done to ensure that there's better labor turnout and there's better factory operations. In a surprising move earlier this year, the opposition parties approved a $6 billion subvention fund for Gaisico in the National Assembly. For the Evening News, Jumo Paul. In the courts, Cleon Benjamin today appeared at the Georgetown Magistrates Court before Magistrate Anne McLennan after he was charged for trying to sneak live rounds into a prison. The charge alleged that on June 4, 2014, he took clothing and footwear to convicted prisoner Anthony Watson at a Camp Street prison. A search was conducted on the articles by a police officer and two live ammunitions were found in the left side of the boots. He was subsequently arrested and charged and was given a sentence of two years imprisonment. Health Minister Dr. Barry Ramsaran has announced that the malaria desk that is being set up at the Oakland International Airport will receive some level of urgency given the outbreak of the chikungunya virus. 
Health Minister Dr. Barry Ramsaran has stated that they are in the initial stages of establishing the malaria deaths at the Ogle International Airport. Ramsaran stated that the death is more important now given the outbreak of the chikungunya virus in the Burbeast area. He said that the initiative is a part of the department's 2014 master plan to reduce malaria cases in Guyana. The deaths will become operational in the coming weeks. The minister praised the support of the Ogle International Airport Management, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Shamdi Oposod, in making the project a reality. Dr. Ramsaran said given the fact that the airport has international status, it is necessary for passengers coming to Guyana to be screened and receive treatment. Also given the mining sector, which is rapidly expanding, persons going to certain interior locations will receive medication while those coming out will be screened. In the next few months, the malaria department will also receive radio service and contact to receive valuable and up-to-date information from remote areas in Guyana. For the evening news, I'm Gabriella Patrick. Back in the courts, 46-year-old Gopal Tiwari of 72 Craig East Bank, Damrara, today appeared at the Georgetown Magistrate's Court before Chief Magistrate Priya Sinarain Bihari after he was slapped with eight charges of fraud. One charge alleged that on April 25, 2014, he intended to defraud Rodwell Chilicott of $4.6 million by falsely pretending to sell him one excavator, while the other charge alleges that on February 1, 2014, he attempted to sell Ryan Adolphus a parcel of commercial land in Eccles for $7 million, which he did not own. The defendant was represented by attorney at law Paul Fangafat and pleaded guilty to all of the charges laid against him. He was sentenced to 16 years imprisonment. The management of the National Milling Company in the Milko hosted an all-day baking seminar on Wednesday at Park Rain Rahman's Park, East Bank, Damarara. More under support. Under the theme, Taking Guyana's Bakeries to the Next Level, the event was in collaboration with Seaboard Corporation USA and N-Grain LLC USA. It presented local bakers with the occasion to learn about the latest developments in the global bread industry and to learn about creating niche products to bring variety to consumers. Minister of Agriculture Honorable Leslie Ramsamy expressed his pleasure at how far Guyana has come as it relates to the manufacturing process, but says Guyana still has a long way to go. I would hope that this seminar gives people ideas, not those ideas in Hafiz's head like going to the bathroom or giving you ideas of how we can spice something. I think that's the right word. Spice up our breakfast, our menus, etc., so that going out can be fun. That we can look forward to seeing variations and different things. The Agriculture Minister noted that the seminar was not just about taking bakeries to the next level, but it also is another step in Guyana's journey in becoming a serious partner and a serious player in the global business and trade environment. He urged the people to work hard so that Guyana can reach the standards to compete against nations of Latin America, the rest of the Caribbean and other countries around the world. Shania Singh for the Evening News. Back in the courts, 27-year-old Leon Fredericks was today refused bail when he appeared at the Georgetown Magistrate's Court before Chief Magistrate Priya Sinarain Behari after he was charged with two counts of simple larceny. The charges alleged that on June 1, 2014, in the company of another, he robbed Maury Leach of one Samsung cell phone worth $60,000. He also allegedly robbed Roshan and Knights of one BlackBerry cell phone valued $87,000, $2,000 in cash and a pair of gold earrings valued $20,000. It is also alleged that on June 2, 2014, at Tiger Bay, he robbed Clifford Dyer of $35,000 in cash, one BlackBerry cell phone, and one watch valued $39,000. During the commission, he also used personal violence. The defendant pleaded not guilty to all the charges. The accused was represented by attorney at law Paul Fungafat, who told the court that his clients usually plays football in the streets, and at a set time, his client was engaged in a match, and it was nothing more than a case of mistaken identity. He is to return to court on June 20. 2014. Join us after the break for your regional international bridge and ferry reports. This is the evening news. Welcome back. This is the evening news on TVG. 
In the region, a new mapping system to help pinpoint the exact location of children at all times was announced yesterday morning by Minister in the, in the Ministry of People and Social Development, Vernella Allen Toppin. Speaking to members of the media, Allen Toppin revealed that news of the mapping system, explaining that she has spoken to the Minister of Education so that they can have markers on children so that from time they are born right through to early childhood, parents will always know where they are. She said the Ministry of the People will be doing the biometric survey. Of course, that story emanating from Trinidad and Tobago. Internationally, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi may visit Washington this fall to meet President Barack Obama, an Indian government source says, signaling a new start in ties. The Times of India and the Hindustan Times reported earlier that Modi, who swept to power in a general election last month, accepted the invitation for talks in September. But a source told Reuters the final details of the visit proposed by Obama when he called to congratulate Modi on his general election victory on May 16 had not yet been set. The U.S. Embassy declined to comment ahead of the visit by the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Nisha Biswal to New Delhi on Friday for the first meetings with the new administration since it took office. Biswal is expected to meet the Foreign Minister Shushma Swaraj and it is possible that Modi's trip could be announced at the end of our visit. India and the United States are keen to boost security and economic ties and the Obama administration has set a goal of quintupling annual bilateral trade to $500 billion. Okay, so just join us. You're watching the evening news. We now take a look at your bridge reports. The Damar Harbour Bridge is expected to be closed from 12 hours on June 7, 2014 for a period of one and a half hours and the Burberry Silver Bridge is expected to be closed from 11 hours on June 7, 2014 for a period of one and a half hours. And for those of you using the ferry service, the Preak and Supernam ferries are slated to depart their respective locations on Saturday, June 7, 2014 at 11 hours. There was no time set officially for its return to those locations. Join us after the break for sports, sponsored by MacWap. This is the Evening News. Welcome back. Now for a look at sport, but first the headlines. GFF president still open to dialogue with aggrieved members. Guyana TNT clash for South Caribbean rugby title. Jason Holder added to West Indies test squad and Guyanese to attend football World Cup courtesy of Banks DIH Limited. Of course, this podcast comes to the kind compliments of Mark Warp. We believe that everything worth building should be built just once. But that is why... We build on culture, on trust, on integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. Welcome back. We start off with some rugby news. Fresh off their 48-19 win against Barbados, a confident Ghana team will face Trinidad and Tobago in an all-important clash tomorrow in the second round of the North American Caribbean Rugby Football Association Regional Championship for the South Caribbean title. Rajiv Bisnot reports. The game is scheduled for 1,600 hours at the National Park Rugby Field. The winner of the game will play the winner of the North Zone featuring current champions USA South, Barbuda and the Cayman Islands for the undisputed title of overall champions on June 28. However, the game is predicted to be an all-out rugby war since both teams have in their respective lineups a number of top quality players. Captain Ryan Gonzalez reiterated that the locals are up to par and fully ready to contest the Trinidadians. I think we did as much we could have in the period of time we had in terms of getting the team tactically ready. Personally, I think it's more mental than anything else. I'm convinced the guys are ready and I'm confident of a win, Gonzalez said. Gonzales added that once the players play the physical game, stay focused and stick to the game plan, they will definitely come out victorious. The Guyanese squad has an attractive blend of youth and experienced players, with the addition of American-based player Valen Adams, who made a return to Guyana to be part of the 15s side. Adams' addition to the team is expected to provide some impression of size against a much bigger Trinidadian side that crushed Guyana last year 20-0 at the University of West Indies campus. 
Football news. President of the Ghana Football Federation, Christopher Matas, has left the door open for aggrieved members to engage him in dialogue, even as their no-confidence motion against him has been disregarded by the world governing body, FIFA. More in the report. Speaking at a press conference on Friday, Matthias invited all Guyanese, including the aggrieved members, to work in the interest of football development in Guyana. We at the GFF have forgiven you for the measures of lies which you would have told to this nation. And let me assure you that if our efforts are directed as regards the development of football, our nation would be a better place in which to live. Matthias, who has faced stern opposition since taking over the helm of the GFF in April 2013, said he's still open to dialogue to forge a way forward for the game. We have been reaching out to them on May the, the 15th. We in, uh, May the 12th, sorry, we invited them to a meeting. May the 15th, in this very same room, we, 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 we've been meeting out with them. They're the ones with the issues and, 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 and have, they have not adopted a posture which indicates that they are interested in resolving any issue whatsoever. In fact... We, we cannot forget that the motion was moved against the president and an executive member and no reason was stated in that, in that motion. To date, we don't know the reasons for the motion of no confidence. But what if the aggrieved members fail to cooperate and shun Matthias's request to have dialogue? But may I assure you that if they are unwilling, the business of football, which is the development of football, will happen. Remaining resolute in his pursuit of football development, Matthias also used the opportunity to restate his purpose as head of the GFF. My mandate is clear to develop, to improve, to promote, regulate and control. And there is no condition attached to that as if, if there are two, per, two or three persons or five persons who are uncomfortable or disgruntled as regards you fulfilling your objective. On Thursday, football's world governing body, FIFA, broke its silence on the ongoing football saga in Guyana, stating that it does not recognize the no-confidence motion filed by a group of aggrieved members against Matthias at the aborted Ordinary Congress on April 26. In a correspondence which was seen by this media house, FIFA also deemed all the decisions taken at the reconvened GFF Congress on May 31 to be invalid. Meanwhile, six Guyanese will soon travel to Brazil to view the Football World Cup finals, complements of an all-expense-paid trip by Banks the Ice Limited, the local distributor of the tournament's main sponsor, Coca-Cola. The drawing to decide the three lucky winners took place on Friday morning at Banks the Ice location on Brigdam in the presence of curious Guyanese. Set to enjoy the World Cup experience free of cost, compliments of Banks DIH Limited and Coca-Cola are Jaimati Ramlakan of Coglan Dam and Podroin, Lawrence Brisport of Amelia's Ward Linden, and Yomati Prashad of Fort Ordinance Burbis. According to communications manager Troy Peters, this is just one of the many promotions Banks DIH Limited has hosted ahead of the World Cup finals in neighboring Brazil. In fact, we have a second promotion also taking place where consumers can win Coca-Cola merchandise including balls, caps, goalkeeping gloves, glasses, aprons, coolers, and so on, all in the spirit of the 2014 World Cup football finals in Brazil. Sales and marketing executive Carton Zhao congratulated the winners and also highlighted which match they will be fortunate to view live. It's, it's going to be a fantastic trip. We get, to, we get to Rio de Janeiro. The game is in Rio de Janeiro, which is we on the other side of Brazil, um, really south of the continent. It's going to be... An all-inclusive stay, hotel, and tours, tours of Rio and the sites of Rio. Um, and then full immersion in that game between Ecuador and France on the 25th of June. Cola has been involved in football since 1974 when it first linked up with FIFA before coming on board as a full-time sponsor of the World Cup finals four years later. This year, the World Cup will be held from June 12 to July 13. Finally, some cricket news. The West Indies fast bowler Jason Holder has been added to the squad for the first test against New Zealand at Sabina Park in Jamaica starting on Sunday. Holder will be the fourth seamer in the 14-man squad that also includes Kimar Roach, Shannon Gabriel and Jerome Taylor. The West Indies cricket board did not explain why an extra fast bowler was included. Holder, aged 22, has featured in the limited over squads of late and has played 17 ODIs and a T20. He has taken 25 ODIs, ODI wickets with a best of four. 13. He also played just one IPL game for the Sunrisers Hyderabad this season. He also took part in the two-week preparatory camp in Barbados. And with that, we've come to the end of sport, which is sponsored by Macorp. And that's a wrap as well on the evening news for today, Friday, June 6, 2014. On behalf of all of us here, I'm Avanar Shamsan. Thanks for watching.